Good evening, brothers and sisters. I hope that uh, this finds you well. Um, thank goodness we're not living in Victoria. We're in New South Wales, and hopefully we will be able to contain what has been a second outbreak. Um, it is still, again, I want to keep you updated, still a while before we are able to get back. Uh, further restrictions have been introduced into New South Wales. It doesn't help us as a church, so be patient with us. As soon as we have any positive news to communicate to you, we will as soon as possible. This evening, we are going to begin our series in the book of Joshua. So I'm really excited about that. As we turn to the Old Testament, I love the Old Testament, and since it makes up more than two-thirds of the Bible, it's necessary for us uh, to be able to understand it and know how it applies to us today. We're not sure of the author of uh, the book of Joshua. It might have been Samuel. Uh, what we do know is that it is God's Word, and it is an account of how the nation took hold of the promised land and how God fulfilled His promise to the nation of Israel in leading them into the promised land. We're going to read from Joshua chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles with you, can I encourage you to turn with me in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 1. Um, if you have it on your phone or whatever medium you're using, um, Joshua is fairly easy to find in the Bible. Reading from verse 1, we're going to read the whole of chap chap chapter 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of Yahweh, Yahweh said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, or the Hittite country to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified and do not be discouraged for Yahweh your God will be with you wherever you go. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your supplies ready. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. But to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, remember the command that Moses, the servant of Yahweh, gave you. Yahweh, your God, is giving you rest and has granted you this land. Your wives, your children, and your livestock may stay in the land that Moses gave you east of the Jordan. But all your fighting men, fully armed, must cross over ahead of your brothers. You are to help your brothers until Yahweh gives them rest as he has done for you, and until they too have taken possession of the land that Yahweh your God is giving them. After that, you may go back and occupy your own land, which Moses the servant of Yahweh gave you east of the Jordan toward the sunrise. Then they answered Joshua, Whatever you have commanded us, we will do, and wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Only may Yahweh your God be with you as he was with Moses. 
whoever rebels against your word and does not obey your words, whatever you may command them will be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. This is God's word. Let's pray together as we turn our attention to hear what God will say to us through his word. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so grateful that you have given us your word. We thank you that your word continues to speak to us today. We thank you that your word is as relevant as it was to Joshua, to us in the 21st century. Oh Lord, help us not to simply dismiss the Old Testament as something that is not for us because we are people of the New Testament. Help us to read it diligently, carefully, meditate upon it, think about it, work it through. And we ask this evening as we spend some time looking into what you commanded Joshua and what you commanded your people to do, that you would help us to understand, give us insight that we lack, and may you exalt your great name for Jesus' sake. Amen. Peter Cartwright, a 19th century circuit-riding Methodist preacher, was an uncompromising man. One Sunday morning when he was to preach, he was told that President Andrew Jackson was in the congregation, and he was warned not to say anything out of line. When Cartwright stood to preach, he said, I understand that Andrew Jackson is here. I've been requested to be guarded in my remarks. Andrew Jackson will go to hell if he does not repent. The congregation was shocked and wondered how the president would respond. After the service, President Jackson shook hands with Peter Cartwright and said, Sir, if I had a regiment of men like you, I could whip the world. Indeed, such courage in the face of someone so important present that this preacher feared God more than he feared who was there and so was able to continue to say what he needed to say. His courage came from God. His courage enabled him to proclaim what was true. And in the same way, Joshua needs great courage. He's facing a mammoth task that lies ahead. He has to now lead a people that Moses has been leading for these past 40 years. He has to take over the reins of someone who is so famous, someone who is so revered and respected, someone who comes in the pages of Scripture repeatedly and is one of the heroes of the Israelites. What a daunting task. And yet... God enables him and strengthens him and raises him up and thrusts him into the midst of battle and gives him the courage that in and of himself he lacks and enables him to take up the reins that Moses left behind and enables him to have courage under fire. And he is under fire. He's under fire because... Are the people going to follow him? He's under fire because there's the raging Georgian, Jordan River that he has to somehow navigate across. He's under fire because there's a land to invade. And all of these things mount up. And yet, in the midst of all of these challenges, there is tremendous courage displayed in Joshua because he is God's man for the job. Let me tell you that as Christians, we need that kind of courage. We live in a very hostile world. We live in a world that doesn't like Christians saying certain things. And when we speak about Scripture, and when we simply rephrase and simply say what the Word of God says, often people will ridicule us. Sometimes it even costs people their job because they quote from Scripture things that are not popular to quote from. Yet at the same time, as a Christian, if you are going to be diligent, if you are going to be faithful to God, you must continue to show courage under fire. 
And when the fire comes in from all those around you who would seek to trip you up, who would seek to make life difficult for you, the only way that you are going to stand is if you stand in the power, in the strength of God, having had courage infused in your heart by God as Joshua experienced. Come with me as we look at this text. Firstly, I want you to notice the reminder of God's promise. The reminder of God's promise. Look at verses 1 to 4. After the death of Moses, the servant of Yahweh, Yahweh said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, or the Hittite country to the great sea on the west. Now hear what God is saying to Moses. Now at one level, you may look at that and say, isn't it obvious that Moses is dead? And of course, it is obvious that Moses is dead. But when you think about that for a moment, imagine if you were in Joshua's shoes. Here is this great leader. God has spoken through him. He has led this people for 40 years. There have been many miracles along the way. And they have witnessed how when Moses comes out of the tabernacle, his face is shining with the glory of God. When he speaks, he speaks God's word. And he is revered and he is held in high esteem. But Moses is dead. And they're not in the promised land yet. Now they've got to get there. And here is this young man, young man in relative terms, of course, who has to step into those big shoes of Moses and take over. Imagine if you were in that situation. Janice and I were watching recently a documentary on the death of Nelson Mandela in South Africa in 2013. And that great statesman who was revered worldwide, not only in South Africa, when he died, who is going to fill his shoes? And as they interviewed various people, they said there's no one around who can fill Nelson Mandela's shoes. And if you think closer to home in Australia... You can imagine what it was like when Robert Menzies finished his prime ministership, having been there the longest of any prime minister. Who was going to take over from Robert Menzies and do such a good job? Or when Bob Hawke was prime minister and had his run as a prime minister and from what I understand was immensely popular. What happened when Bob Hawke finished? Who was going to take over and run the country and be as popular as him. And when you have leaders that stand out like that, it's very hard to find someone who can fill their shoes. And yet, God says to Joshua, I ordained you way back. I ordained you to take over from Moses. You remember when the, the incident of the 12 spies going into the land and coming back and spying it out and coming back with a report. And only two of those spies, Joshua and Caleb, gave a positive report and said, let's go. God is with us. We can take these guys. And yet the rest of the spies came back and said, no, they're too big. They're too strong. We can't go in there. Let's just stay out. And Joshua and Caleb are commended. And it's because of that faithfulness, that integrity before God. That trust in Yahweh, that Yahweh raises up Joshua as the one who will succeed Moses. And what he wants these people to understand is that Moses is his man. Moses, uh, sorry, Joshua is his choice. Joshua is his man. He has raised him up for this very purpose that he might help the people take the land that God has given them. There's another uh, thing at play here, and that is that God's promises are always true. Just because Moses is dead doesn't mean that God is no longer going to fulfill his promises. 
Moses' death is not a setback in God's economy. It's not as if God is panicking in heaven and saying, what am I going to do now? My great leader is no longer around. No, God has already purposed that Joshua would lead the people. So God has got it all in hand and he wants the people to understand that instead of reminiscing on the past, instead of thinking back to what Moses did and what Moses was as their leader, now they must look to Joshua because Joshua is is God's appointment. And he is part of God's succession plan. God always has successes when great leaders pass from this world to the next. I know that sometimes it's tempting to think that we are indispensable. Sometimes we like to think we are so important that if we were no longer around, the particular ministry we're in might not be as fruitful as it was because we're not running it anymore. But I can tell you with absolute certainty that if I, as the pastor, one of the pastors of this church, were to die tonight, this church would continue to function and you would get a committee together and sooner or later you would appoint another pastor who would take up the reins and the work would continue. None of us is indispensable. And when leadership passes from one to another, we need to trust that God in his sovereignty is already preparing someone to take over the reins of leadership. We need not think of ourselves more importantly than what we are, for none of us are indispensable in God's work. And God's work will always continue in spite of of some great leaders not uh, uh, continuing. We see this even through the centuries where you had great leader, leaders like Martin Luther succeeded by John Calvin. And then you had leaders like Charles Spurgeon. Uh, you had leaders like um, Martin Lloyd-Jones and we've had others, James Packer who died recently, John Stott. God always has people waiting in the wings to raise them up and continue with his purposes being fulfilled through his people. So we should take great encouragement from that, knowing that God always keeps his work going and God always completes his purposes and no purpose of God can be thwarted simply because someone dies. We see this with Elijah and Elisha. When Elijah died, who was going to take over from Elijah? And Elisha succeeds him and in fact ends up doing more miracles than Elijah did. God has got the situation in hand. There's something even more interesting in this text. The very name of Joshua is Yeshua in the Hebrew. It means the Lord saves. Now you cannot look at Joshua and see his role as continuing on in the deliverance of Israel without realizing and understanding that Joshua is a forerunner to the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, his name is the very first name that has the name of Yahweh in it. Jesus is another form of Joshua. So that Joshua ultimately points us forward to a much greater deliverer than him. God, God used Joshua to deliver people into the land of Canaan, to take possession of that land. Jesus comes into this world to deliver us from the clutches of Satan, to deliver us from our sin, to rescue us from being chained to the, the devil. And he enables us through his death on the cross, through his suffering and through his resurrection, enables us to have our sins forgiven, to have our burden lifted and enable us to take possession of a much greater prize than what the people of Israel took possession of. Their uh, inheritance was the land. Our inheritance is going to be living with God forever in eternity because Jesus, our deliverer, came into this world and suffered the penalty that we deserve, paid the price that we should have paid, died in our stead and became our deliverer and offers that deliverance to all who would come. That's why Matthew in chapter 1 verse 21 says, uh, he is the, uh, his name, he will, you will call him Jesus because 
He will save his people from their sins. And so can I say to you, if you have never brought your burden of sin to Jesus, if you've never laid it at the foot of the cross, if you've been ignoring his call upon your life to repent, to turn away and to come to him and to lay it there that he might become your deliverer and take away this burden that you're carrying around of sin, can I encourage you, turn to Jesus. He holds out his hand. He desires and seeks to deliver you. For he is a gracious God, wanting that none should perish, but all should come to repentance and faith in himself. Secondly, I want you to notice the assurance of God's presence. Look at verses 5 to 7a, verse 9 and verse 17, verses 5 to 7. Let me read them for you. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Let me tell you, that same wording comes in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Be strong and courageous. Because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Do you think God is trying to make a point? Be careful to obey all the law uh, my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn to it from the right or to the left. If I can keep going, verse 9. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. Why? For Yahweh, your God, will be with you wherever you go. Look at verse 17. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Only, in fact, the word is stronger than may. It should be will. The Lord or Yahweh, your God, will be with you as he was with Moses. You see, if he is going to go into the land, when you think about what lies ahead, conquering of the land, crossing of the Jordan, managing this people who have proved to be so rebellious and so stubborn and stiff-necked against Moses, then he needs to have the assurance that God will be with him. Because if he knows that God is with him, then whatever comes his way, however challenging it may be, he can face it confidently because he's not facing it alone. God is right there with him. And God is strengthening him. Thus, repeatedly, God says, be very strong and courageous. And the reason he can say that to Moses is because of the promise and the assurance that he will continue to presence himself with uh, with Joshua. The one thing that Joshua needed to know and he needed to count on is that if he was going to lead this people, he needed a strength that came from without. He could not do it on his own abilities. He did not have the strength. He he couldn't muster it up in and of himself. He knew that God would have to empower him. God would have to enable him. And that meant that God would have to be with him in every situation, all of the time, if he was going to lead this people. And so God gives him this assurance that I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. What wonderful assurance. Those same words come in the author of the Hebrews in chapter 13, verse 5, where he says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. It is the word that comes to every believer that God assures them in whatever situation they find themselves, wherever they are, whatever challenge they face, however great it may be, however pressed down they may be, he is always with them. And let me add to that and remind you that the reason you can confidently count on the presence of God is not because you measure up 
morally, not because you get everything right in your life, not because you're the most spiritual person around, but because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. God's presence is assured for the sake of his son. And so we can know with absolute certainty that God is always near to us. He is, Jesus refers to himself as Emmanuel, God with us, God present in our circumstances. I know that sometimes when we go through great difficulties and life becomes very challenging and we feel pressed down and burdened with all the cares of life and all the worries and anxieties that assail our mind and that might even affect our, us physically, I know it's very easy to become despondent. It's very easy to become disillusioned. It's very easy to want to throw in the towel and and give up and wonder where God is in all of this chaos that we experience in this world because of this brokenness that we have to deal with on a daily basis. But can I assure you this evening, you need to know that whatever you experience, no matter how deep the bog is that you're in, no matter how fast you're sinking in that quicksand, God is always present with you. There's a wonderful story told of a pastor who was visiting uh, a man, an old Scotsman, who was very ill. And the family had called for their pastor to come and minister to him. As he entered the, the room of the sick man, he noticed another chair in the opposite side of the bed, a chair which had been drawn close. And so this pastor said, Well, Donald, I see I'm not your first visitor for the, for the day. The old man looked up and he was a little bit puzzled. And then suddenly he recognized from the nod of the head of the pastor that he had noticed the empty chair. Well, pastor, I'll tell you about my chair. Many years ago, I found it quite difficult to pray. So one day I shared this problem with my pastor. He told me not to worry about kneeling or about placing myself in some pious posture, wise advice, let me tell you. Instead, he said, just sit down, put a chair opposite you, and imagine Jesus sitting in it, and then talk to him as you would a friend. That's great advice, let me tell you, if you struggle to pray. The aged Scot then added, I've been doing that ever since. Short time later, the daughter of the Scot called the pastor. When he answered, she informed him that her father died very suddenly. She was quite shaken, for she had no idea that he was so near to death. Then she continued, I'd just gone to lie down for an hour or two, for he seemed to be sleeping so comfortably. When I went back, he was dead. Then she added thoughtfully, except now his hand was on the empty chair at the side of the bed. Isn't that strange? And the pastor said, no, it's not strange. I understand. Even in your greatest moment of crisis, when death comes to your door, God is with you. So can I encourage you to remember that whatever you may be experiencing, whatever challenge lies ahead, if it's the challenge of finding employment because you've become unemployed as a result of COVID, if it's the challenge of being able to sort out a problem that's arisen in your marriage, if it's a problem you're having with a child and knowing how to try and deal with that problem in a wise way, if it's a problem with a parent, an aged parent, a sick person, if it's just the cares of life that have pressed in on you and you feel as though you don't know where to turn and how you're going to survive this, if it's just the awe that's associated with this COVID-19 and some of the restrictions that have caused you perhaps to become a little bit disillusioned, can I say to you, if you are a child of God. He's with you. He's present with you. Never for a moment 
doubt his presence, even if you don't feel it. You need to remind yourself that he has said in his word, Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Rest in that promise. Thirdly, I want you to notice the importance of God's word. Look at verses 7b to 8. The importance of God's word. Be very strong and very courageous. Be careful. Hear this very carefully. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn to, from it to the right or to the left. That you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Now I want you to hear that very clearly. If you want to hear a good sermon on the necessity of God's word, can I encourage you to listen to Pastor Will's sermon that he preached last Sunday evening. It's on YouTube. You'll be able to find it if you uh, follow and type in uh, looking for it. But can I encourage you to listen to it? There is an absolute requirement that Joshua must adhere and obey everything that is written in the word of God. It is his food. He must feast on it. He must meditate on it. That meditation is not an Eastern mystical meditation where you empty the mind. It's in fact exactly the opposite. You fill the mind. You focus upon God. You focus upon his word. You focus upon his works. And then added to all of that, part of the meditation in the Old Testament on the Word of God was to read it out aloud. Something perhaps we should be doing in our own homes, in the privacy of our own home. You don't have to read it out loudly, but read it out aloud. It is allowing the Word of God to infiltrate, to penetrate into the very depths of our soul. And there may it stay. And there may we feast upon it. And our food is to feast on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it becomes fundamental for us as Christians, like for Joshua, that if we are going to be successful in the success here that is spoken about in Scripture, I'm going to quote soon from a, one of the commentators, is not a materialistic financial uh, uh, success that sometimes we can reduce this text to, but rather it is success in our relationship with God, in our lives before God, God, in our holiness before God, in our obedience before God, in our morality before God, in our sanctification before God. And all of that comes from our meditation upon the Word of God. It's so important that we don't dismiss parts of God's Word. It's so easy for us to simply concentrate on the bits we like. You know, I only read certain parts and when I get to other parts that are more difficult, I either skip them altogether or I read them as fast as I can just to get through it so I don't have to think about it. Now, to be sure that even some of the writers of Scripture say there are things of first importance in the Bible, so there's no doubt there are certain doctrines more important than other doctrines in Scripture. Nevertheless... All scripture is God-breathed, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in all righteousness. And so we mustn't simply write off parts of God's word because either it offends our sensibilities or we don't like it because it illuminates on our sin and exposes our sin. And since we don't want our sin to be exposed, we just simply move beyond reading those particular verses in Scripture. And we shouldn't simply dismiss large parts of the Old Testament because we find it particularly difficult 
difficult, but perhaps we need to slow down a bit and to get a commentary, a simple commentary, and sit down with that commentary so that as we read Scripture, we open a commentary, and when we get stuck and we don't understand it, we can read some of the comments of the commentator. Don't get a complicated commentary. Get something simple, something easy to understand. But it's so important that you and I make sure that we are people of the book that we focus on the Word of God and that we don't neglect our reading of the Word, that we don't neglect our meditation upon the Word, that we bury it deep within our souls. Now, to be sure, not everyone has the same kind of memory. Some people have great memories. They read, and as they read, they can memorize things quite quickly. Other people really struggle to memorize anything. And even when they've memorized stuff, they may forget it a little bit later. God understands all of that. He's made us all differently. And so we don't have a one-size-that-fits-all kind of approach to the Word of God. What we do want to ensure is that it's the best of how God has gifted us us and to the best of the ability that God has given us, that we at least spend time in that word and where we are able to try and memorize where we can. And if you don't have a great memory and it takes a bit longer and perhaps you're not going to memorize as much as someone else who's got a good memory, don't let it worry. Don't let it concern you. Don't become disillusioned. Don't give up the, the, the effort of trying to memorize scripture. Maybe just take short little verses and memorize them here and there if that would be helpful. But we must all focus on the Word. Now, there's another thing that comes out of here on this uh, Word of God. It's not simply a knowing of the Word of God, but it's a obedience to the Word of God. That's why he says you must do everything written in the law. In other words, you don't get to pick and choose in terms of your obedience You don't get to decide when you're going to obey and when you're not going to obey. Jesus says in John 15, if you love me, you will obey my commands. So the obedience to the commands of Jesus is contingent, is dependent upon your love for him. So that out of my love for him flows my obedience To the Word of God. So if I'm struggling in the area of obedience to God's Word, perhaps I need to fall more in love with Jesus. Perhaps I need to get to know Jesus more intimately. Perhaps I need to spend more time sitting at His feet and feeding on Him spiritually that I might grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ that I might move on from milk to solid food, that I might begin to wrestle more and more with who he is and all that he has done. And as I come to know him more deeply, inevitably I will come to love him more passionately. And when I love him more passionately, out of that love will come the desire to want to please him, to want to live in obedience to him. And so can I encourage you, spend some time in the Word of God. And then can I say to you the last point, and I want to do this quickly. Fourthly, I want you to notice the unity of God's people, verses 12 through to 18. The unity of God's people. This is so important. But the Reubenites and the Ganites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, remember the command that Moses, the servant of Yahweh, gave you. Yahweh, your God, has given you rest and has granted you this land. Your wives and your children, your livestock, may stay in the land that Moses gave you east of the Jordan, but all your fighting men, fully armed, must cross over ahead of your brothers. You are to help your brothers until Yahweh gives them rest, just as he has done for you. And until they have taken possession of the land that Yahweh your God is giving them. After that, you may go back and occupy your own land, which Moses, the servant of Yahweh, gave you east of the Jordan toward the sunrise. Let me just end it there for the sake of time. Unity of God's people is fundamental. 
Now, the danger, of course, is if you know the story, when the tribe of uh, the Reubenites and Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh saw the land east of the Jordan, they wanted to stay there because they liked it. And so they went and asked permission from Moses. Moses prayed and said, yes, you can stay there, but only if you remember to be one with the people who are the other side of the Jordan and you are to help them to take the land and you are also to commemorate the feasts in the land with them and you are not to set up altars on this side of the Jordan. And so there were certain stipulations that were there for this, this group of people staying this side. And one of the important things was that because they had rest on their side, they couldn't just sit back and say, well, you know, we're at rest. We don't have to go to war. This, we're in this land. We're occupying it. You guys, well, good luck. Hope it goes well. May the campaign be successful. No, they were there to go with the fighting men and help the other fighting men of the other tribes to take the land and take possession of it. And so there was a a commitment that they gave to the rest of the Israelites that they would help them in this. And so Joshua reminds them of this commitment and he reminds them that they must not forsake the covenant they've entered into with the others. And they respond by saying, we will obey. And in fact, so seriously do they take the unity of God's people that they say, if anyone disobeys, if anyone says, I'm out of here, I'm not going, they will be put to death. Now what's being stressed here, it's obvious, is it not? That God considers precious the unity and the oneness of his people. And anything that threatens that unity does not come from God. And what is true of the Israelites is equally true of the New Testament. God has created one people. We are unified in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not our job to create unity. Hear me carefully. That unity has already been established and it has been established through the Lord Jesus Christ uniting us together when he brings us into his family and he saves us. And we are one together as Christians. There are no Baptists, Methodists, Anglicans or any other kind of uh, denominations in heaven. There's only one people and all of them are Christians. And Jesus says we are to strive to maintain the unity that he has already created. Let me read some scriptures. Make every effort, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Paul writing to the Ephesians reminds them of the importance of this unity. That Nothing must be allowed to threaten the oneness of God's people. And therefore, we must be very careful in how we maintain that unity. We must not allow ourselves to cause disruption to the oneness of God's people. And that doesn't mean we all have to agree on everything. We are not calling and God is not calling for uniformity where every one of us has to think exactly the same. Uh, If that were the case, one of us would be redundant. It's not saying we can't have different views and different opinions, but when it comes to the fundamentals, when it comes to the things of first importance, when it comes to those doctrines that are essential for salvation, essential doctrines of God, the doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ, and so on, on those things we must remain unified. There is no reason for us to depart over those doctrines. We must ensure that we keep that unity that God has created in us. And so 
it means that as we do that, we care for each other, we love each other, we try and operate always in peace. And where we disagree, if we disagree on when Jesus Christ is coming, let us disagree in love and let us maintain the relationships we have and let us not allow those relationships to be affected by those doctrines that are secondary or third doctrines that are unimportant and help us, not unimportant, but unimportant in terms of them not being fundamental. And I pray that as we maybe have those different ideas and different views on different topics, that we will ensure that when we express our views, we always do it in love. That we don't seek to enter into arguments for the sake of wanting to be disruptive, for the sake of wanting to argue, for the sake of wanting to cause dis disruption, or for the sake of promoting our own aims, our own purposes, our own ideas, and trying to squash anyone who opposes us. No, we must maintain the unity as much as we are able and according to the strength that God gives us. If I can close with a quick illustration on that and then I'm done. There is a legend about a herd of mules that was attacked at night by a pack of wolves from a nearby forest. When the wolves came, the mules began kicking viciously in all directions. Consequently, the mules maintained and injured each other while the agile wolves escaped unharmed. Finally, a wise old mule called the rest together for a conference and made known his plans. That night, the wolves came yelping from the forest as usual, but instead of the mules kicking, they all ran and put their heads in a circle and began kicking outward. The wolves were put to flight and the mules did no harm to each other. Christians need to put their heads together and kick outward against the forces of iniquity. We have enough opposition from without to worry about. Let us not create opposition within, but let us maintain the unity of the Spirit. And don't let us allow disagreements on non-essentials to cause us to break away, to cause us to split, to cause us to leave, to cause us to create disruption within the body of Christ. Let us learn to love each other with all our faults, with all our foibles, with all the things that we have that perhaps are different to others and in those things that we disagree on. Let's do so and let's do it in love, remembering that we need to be one people. If we are going to be fruitful, if we are going to be effective in the kingdom of God, then we need to be one of one mind and one pur purpose as we submit ourselves to the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement we receive from it. And we pray that you would help us as we continue to minister, as we continue to serve you, as we continue to seek to see others come to Christ that you would help us to be courageous, that you would help us, like Joshua, to know that your presence is with us, to know that you will fulfill your promises, to know, Lord Jesus, that your word is our foundation, your word is our launching pad, to know your word, to be able to preach it confidently, to be able to not minimize it, to not water it down, to not allow it to be dismissed because we don't like certain parts of us, but help us to be people of the book. And help us, Lord Jesus, to maintain our unity as your people. For you have created us as one. We are brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray for those who are outside of the church, those who don't know you. Lord, you have come as a deliverer. You have come to deliver them from their sin. You have come to rescue them. And I pray that you would draw them to yourself, that you would show them their need of the Savior, that you would reveal their sin, and that you would help them to fall at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ for his sake. Amen. Mm -hmm.